It's great to welcome back to the program today, Alok Kanoja, who is a psychiatrist practicing in Boston and on the faculty at Harvard Medical School. Also, the co-founder of Healthy Gamer, an organization that uses meditation and the latest neuroscience and psychotherapy advances to help video gamers take back control of their lives. Alok, great to have you on. Thanks a lot, David. So we have heard this week in the wake of a couple of, of mass shootings, once again, this idea of we should be looking at violence in video games as a possible cause of the, the real world violence that was committed by these young individuals. So there's a mm -hmm. few different things that I've been talking about. One is, do we even know anything about the gaming history of these individuals? If we don't, then what are we even really talking about? Number two, uh, even if we did, that would not necessarily be a causal relationship. And there's quite a bit of scholarship, actually, about the link between violence in video games and other forms of media and real world violence. And then beyond that, when we look particularly at El Paso, uh, you had really what were to me uh, white nationalist anti-immigrant motivations, which I don't mm -hmm. know for sure, but that I've not seen that as a theme of any video games I've heard of nevertheless. So where can we, what's a good entry point for us if we want to think about this from a scientific and medical perspective to even start considering whether this is a possibility? Absolutely. So that's a fantastic question. I think the best entry point is there was a study that was actually published this year, which is something called a meta-analysis which pools data from lots of different studies and sees if we can draw an overarching conclusion. Um, and there was a study that was done this year that basically showed that there, if there is an effect, which it's not really clear whether there is or isn't, the effect is incredibly small. And specifically what video games do is in, in a very small way, increase internal feelings of aggression. Right. Um, but the, the interesting thing about the study is that the reason that the effect size is so small is because there have been many, many studies done over the last decade that have really conflicting results. So one study done um, in 2015, basically, which was a very rigorous study, found that there is no effect of increasing violent tendencies or even feelings of aggression after playing video games. There are some fMRI studies, which are sort of functional neuroscience imaging studies, which show that playing video games actually suppress our emotional, uh, the emotional parts of our brain. And this is why, like, you know, if you've had a long day and you're stressed out and you go home and you play a video game, like that helps you feel better because it actually shuts off emotional parts of your brain. Uh, and so, so l let me dig into that a little, cause there's already a lot there that I think is relevant sure. to talk about. So you, you talked about the possibility of being linked to uh, aggression in some general sense in some studies. When I interviewed Erica Scharr from the University of Massachusetts six years ago, whose perspective is more from a communication sociology perspective, she at the time was involved in a lot of similar scholarship, which suggested at a very broad level that there are some studies which show that video games can sort of um, uh, set off or encourage aggressive behavior in people with certain predispositions already, uh, but that anything beyond that it does not seem to be supported by the scholarship. It sounds like you're not saying the same thing, but you're sort of thinking along the same lines in your interpretation. Well, yeah. So I think the big difference is that over the last six years, we've had way more studies. Right. And, and the simple fact is that they're highly conflicting which generally speaking suggests that, you know, so you have some studies that show that there's no link. You have some studies that show that there are increasing feelings of aggression, um, but the feelings of aggression also don't correlate to real world violence. So there's a big gap in, even if you say that a, a video game increases feelings of aggression, which is easily disputed, um, the effect is relatively small. And then it's a big jump to say, feelings of aggression increase or correlate to real world violence. Like, so you could look at even something like sporting events, like people have high feelings of aggression during sporting events, but we don't blame like football for mass shootings. And so that causative link is still like it's it's a huge causative link. Yeah. Although I wonder if we could blame some of those escalated feelings of aggression during sporting events for fights during and after the sporting events themselves, which is quite oh, a more common phenomenon. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. But but in that case, you have a you have a temporal link because you have sports fans that are inebriated and and really gung ho about their their team and then they get into fights. Yeah. But that's that's a far cry from from video games. 
Let me propose right, something else, not as something I think is the case, but that I, I, I think should be considered if we're opening up this door, which is, is it possible that playing a violent video game could actually be a substitute for committing real world violence? And I'm asking this not in a rhetorical sense, like, is that a possibility? Yes, absolutely. So I, I think that there's actually neuroscience data to suggest that that is the case. So when someone feels aggressive, like I was saying earlier, like when you feel like aggressive or pissed off about something, playing a video game, like why are they fun? Why are they recreational? It's because they sort of, they, they decrease our negative experience of emotion in the moment, which is exactly what recreation is designed to do. So I, I've worked with a lot of gamers and have actually found the, so I started out sort of working with people around helping them with video game addiction. But the more I've worked with gamers over the last year, I've started to appreciate more and more positive effects of video games. And I think that that's an area of research which is like completely untouched because everyone's focusing on addiction. Now people are focusing on violence, but there are a lot of potential positive effects of video games, which we, we we're just sort of scratching the surface for. Yeah, I mean, it feels weird to me uh, to to be coming out and and really trying to expose the the sort of lack of substance between be, behind starting to blame video games as a sort of concerted talking point for these shootings. And the reason it feels weird is because, a, a, as a you know student of communication. Uh, there are so many areas in which we should be talking about the effect on culture, society, psychology of the messages that we get from media. This includes news media. This includes movies and TV shows, and it includes video games and, and social media, wh whether it comes to antisocial behavior, whether it there, you know, there's so much material here of things we really should be talking about that it feels strange to now have to be put in this position of saying, wait a second the specific link that these politicians are talking about between the video games and the mass shootings, that one we've got to fight. But there are lots of other things I wish we could be talking more about. And I, I can't agree with you more, David. So I think the most dangerous thing about doing this is that it deflects from the variables that I think are actually linked to mass shootings. Right. So so by creating a political discussion about violence in video games, you're turning away from factors that I think actually contribute. And even if you do something about violence in video games, let's say you reduce like violent exposure to video games, the data suggests that there are far more important variables that actually correlate with uh, school shootings, which you're doing nothing about. Like what? What would be those variables? <laughs> so um, uh, to be blunt, access to guns. So you, the number of people who play video games and the access to violent video games is basically the same all over the world. And you can look at societies like the UK and Australia as being socioeconomically and culturally like close to the United States. And they have like 400, so we have 450 times as many uh, shooting related deaths as the UK, even though our our exposure to video games is about the same. So now what's is that is that population adjusted because we have drastically different Absolutely. populations as well. It's so so in the United States, it's four point four three deaths per hundred thousand people. Got it. In the UK, I think it's zero point six zero deaths per hundred thousand people. So it's absolutely population adjusted. And so why do we have like four hundred times more uh, like deaths related to guns if the UK and the US were playing the same amount of video games, it has to be something else. And there are studies that show that, for example, in Australia, after the Christchurch shooting, they implemented very strong gun control laws. Yeah. And the amount of shootings went way down. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that there may be a relatively small sample size anyway to compare to, to compare to in a country with a, with a far smaller population. But I think that sure. I, I look forward to seeing the full data on that. I think you're starting to get to I mean, yeah, I, for me, access to guns is absolutely a part of this. But there's something else which is actually a, a, a much more cultural thing, which I want to talk to you about, sure. which is I think that in the United States, there is much more of a culture either a, a, as a sort of uh, a, a definitive thing or as a de facto thing of seeing firearms as a way to solve different types of problems that is mm -hmm. different than in other countries. The idea that if there is a political problem, you might be able to solve it with a firearm. If there is an, an interpersonal or a personal mental health issue uh, or, or grievance of some kind, that the firearm is seen as a tool in a way that 
does not seem to be the case in many other countries. I think that's a really astute observation. And I think that the, so the, the where I kind of go from that is where do people get that idea? Mm -hmm. Right. So you're saying that people are fundamentally viewing firearms as solutions to problems. And I think what's more dangerous than video games, far more dangerous, is actually these sort of echo chamber toxic communities on the Internet, which like the more I've done stuff with Healthy Gamer, the more I sort of get people who are looking for help. And and the more I sort of sort of see this side of the Internet and you can look at some of these communities like 8chan and, um, you know, Reddit recently has been banning certain subreddits and things like that. And they're basically communities where some kind of toxic mentality or violence as a solution gets propagated. And these communities are so sort of incestuous that you kind of don't get any sort of outside um, perspective. And so people start to they, they believe something and then everything that they read and every person that they talk to as a member of this community reinforces that belief. And then someone from this community goes and, and gets their 15 minutes of fame by shooting up, you know, Walmart or a school. And then they're actually like lauded within these communities. They're 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 viewed as like heroes. And so I think that kind of that kind of like psychological indoctrination which is going on through through some of these toxic Internet communities is like really dangerous. So could there be sort of like a third factor correlation where you have maybe the shootings? Th there may be a correlation with the, the, the sort of antisocial self-perpetuating echo chambers of hate that exist online. And it just so happens that many of the people in those communities happen to also be playing video games because of their sort of societal or or um, social situation, but that is not a causal connection. Is that a possibility? Absolutely. So, so what you're talking about is essentially something called a confounding variable, which is something that's related to the, the root and the outcome, but is actually like somewhat separate. Mm. So I, th I think that the, the gaming community and some of these toxic internet communities have a heavy amount of overlap. Um, there's also a heavy amount of overlap with mental health. That's tends to be pretty undiagnosed. And so I, I think that, you know, people who spend a lot of time sort of living on the Internet also play video games because that's a major form of their recreation. It's a major form of their community. And video games can build community, both like positive community and negative community. Um, I've worked with people who, you know, have have felt like the community they've gained through the Internet is, is really important to them. Um, so I think it's absolutely possible that it's kind of a third variable and related to each of those, but is not causal. You, you talked about um, uh, undiagnosed mental health stuff. So without diagnosing any particular people or particular shooters, I let's dig in a little bit to the mental health thing, because that's also a common talking point, which is the problem mm -hmm. of gun violence is mental health and not access to guns. One thing is which we don't have to get into that a lot of the same people claiming that aren't doing anything to increase access to mental health treatment. And that's a, a, just an obvious hypocrisy, which we don't have to sort of drill drill down on right now. But if we want to think about mental health, what are the conditions that we're talking about that may uh, uh, in, a, in this world where we take the mental health issue more seriously preclude someone from legal access to a firearm? Is there some set list that anyone has proposed? I've not seen one. And that raises a whole host of new questions as well. I mean, does anxiety mean if we take mental health seriously, if you diagnose diagnosed with anxiety, you don't get a gun. I mean, that's a whole other Pandora's box. Well, yeah. So, David, I think there's a subtle problem in the way that you're framing your question and yes. you're presuming that because you're accepting the premise that mental health leads to gun violence. Right. Well, that I'm, I'm saying even if we could establish that, then what do we do? So I'm not necessarily accepting it. I'm saying what if we, what if it were true, then how would we even deal with that? Yeah. So I, I think that that becomes problematic because when we talk about mental illness, there are two kinds of mental illness. Like you can lump mental illness into two big categories. Yes. One is personality disorders. So these are not things that happen to you. These are part of who you are. So when we think of someone like a sociopath or a psychopath, that's not a condition that someone sort of randomly gets afflicted with. You can be like, for example, a postpartum mother and experience depression for the first time in your life. Right. So some mental health issues are things that sort of happen to you. You can develop anxiety, you can develop depression and some parts of what we consider mental health or mental illnesses are actually like baked into your personality structure. So when I think about people, the profile of a school shooter, 
These are people that have something more personality oriented um, and don't necessarily, I don't think that the social anxiety that they have, which many of them experience, um, is causative. It's a factor, but I think the social anxiety leads to isolation, which then sort of creates this, this interesting, like perfect storm of social isolation, toxic internet communities, glorification of gun violence, and then you sort of end up with a school shooter. So I, I don't think there's a particular diagnosis, but if it's anything, it's probably something more in the realm of personality disorder as opposed to something like depression or anxiety. Yeah. Yesterday I was talking to former neo-Nazi Frank Mink, who in the 90s um, uh, got out of that movement. And when I said, what was it that could have prevented you from getting in in the first place? Because life circumstances seem to be very similar for a lot of the people that get sucked into those movements and eventually commit real world violence. He said that empathy from others when he was growing up was what he identified. And what's interesting about that is that doesn't seem to be linked so much to the inbuilt personality disorders that you're talking about and seems more circumstantial. Absolutely. So, so, uh, uh, David, I think this is exactly what, how healthy gamer has evolved because what I realize is it's not like a mental illness that's causing this. There are other factors. It's isolation. It's a lack of empathy. It's feeling powerless. It's, it's sort of viewing the world in a very like tinted way. And so I think a big problem when we're kind of talking about gaming and gamers is that a lot of people are talking about gamers. You have, you have people like us, like I, I'm a, I'm an expert. And in, 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 you know, like radio shows, we're talking about gamers, politicians are talking about gamers, researchers are talking about gamers. And I think what, what your, what Frank Mink's story illustrates is that it's talking to the person that's actually the most important, right? It's forming an empathic connection with an individual human being that causes someone to change their lives. And, and it's, I completely agree with that hundred percent. And that's sort of the ethos around healthy gamer, which is like, we need to start talking to people who are struggling and help that like help them. It's not about gun control. It's not about increased access to mental health resources. It's on a very fundamental level. If you think about what worked for Frank Mink, it's an individual human reaching out to him and like making an empathic connection. And that's really what we're trying to do. And I think that's really what the overall answer is. It's not restricting access based on a diagnosis. It's it's connecting to individual human beings who feel isolated and helping them feel connected and yeah. cared for. A difficult thing to do uh, in, a, in a large scale, for sure. Um, we've been speaking with psychiatrist Alok Kanoja, who's also co-founder of Healthy Gamer. Uh, so great to have you back on, uh, although not under the best circumstances. Yeah. Thank you very much, David. It, it was awesome being on the show. And um, thank you.